Welcome back to Odyssey Academy, and we are moving on to lesson number five. So in lesson number five, we are gonna talk about solving your specific long-term problem, or solving a long-term problem in general. Uh, now, here's the issue. You are gonna be solving your long-term problem. I am not going to be solving a long-term problem because that would be outside assistance. So what this lesson is designed to do is to walk you through how to solve a long-term problem in general. You actually get to solve your specific long-term problem. So we're working on these sort of simultaneously. I will present you with the long-term problem format, how to think about what each of the sections mean, and it's up to you then to start solving and brainstorming ideas to solve your specific problem. Now, the good news is, we just talked about brainstorming and creativity in lesson four, and now you get a chance to apply it as you go about solving your specific long-term problem. So let's dive into our agenda. Uh, we're gonna start with what your long-term problem is all about, trying to figure out what they're asking you to do. Uh, what are the required elements of your specific long-term problem? How will those elements be scored? Uh, thinking about creating a calendar or a schedule to make sure you can get all those required elements completed in time before competition. And then this last concept here is thinking about your problem as a big picture. What's the big picture of your problem? Then focusing in on the details, the minutia, on what the problem is asking you to do, all the specifics. And then taking a step back at the end and looking at the big picture once more to make sure that you've actually addressed and solved the problem, right? Not getting too lost in the weeds. So we'll talk about that in detail when we get there. So let's go ahead and start with what is your long-term problem actually about? What are you expected to do? Now, for the sake of this example and the examples to come, I'm using a previous year's long-term problem. And specifically, I'm using the effective detective, which was the classics problem from 2019 and 2020. But here's the, the great thing. All long-term problems have the same structure. We've already talked about that, right? So you can look at your problem for this year and understand what the problem is, right? What they're asking you by using this as an example template, right? So uh, let's start here with what is the central problem you're solving? Well, it's spelled out for you at the very beginning of your long-term problem in the section called, wait for it, the problem, right? So you'll see section A right here is called the problem and there's a bunch of text. This text right here explicitly tells you what is the problem that you and your team are going to be solving this particular year, right? Uh, now, a couple of things about the problem section. So it gives you the general overview, which is great. It also highlights two specific things. The first thing is what's called the creative emphases, right? So where is the creative emphasis placed throughout the problem? What does that mean? A lot of fancy words. The creative emphases are, pertains to the elements that are included in your problem where your team has the opportunity to be as creative as possible. We know that creativity means original and effective, right? So what the creative emphases are, the problem here is highlighting the different components of your specific problem where judges are going to be scoring you on how original and how effective those elements are, right? So there might be some other requirements in the problem, which are great, but in the creative emphases, that's where originality and effectiveness, the creativity components, are going to be scored the most, right? So that's where you can really shine on your, your creative elements, all right? So the creative emphases are mentioned within this problem section. And the other thing that's mentioned is what's called the spirit of the problem. What is the spirit of the problem? Well, uh, the spirit of the problem highlights exactly what the team is expected to do at bare minimum, right? So every team must solve the problem. And the thing about OM is that it's super open-ended, right? We talked about divergent thinking. We talked about there being many solutions to the same problem. However, we also talked about the fact that creativity has limitations and those limitations help make us more creative. So sometimes really clever teams think, well, the problem didn't say we had to do this. So we're gonna be super original. We're gonna kind of do this really off the wall. Uh, really unexpected thing, which is great in terms of originality. That's fantastic. But sometimes when we come up with a solution like that, we're not actually solving the problem that's been stated, right? So we're not solving what the long-term problem tells us we have to do. So if that's the case, then we're not actually adhering to or addressing the spirit of the problem, right? The spirit of the problem is what's expected of all teams. So that's the idea of spirit of the problem. Sometimes creative emphases and spirit of the problem overlap. Sometimes the things we're expected to do in the spirit of the problem 
are creative elements, right? So they'll have creative emphasis, uh, but sometimes they're not, right? Sometimes there are components that must be included that aren't being scored for creativity or not as much. Uh, so they're part of the spirit of the problem, but aren't necessarily, they don't have necessarily creative emphasis. So point of the story is creative emphases are all the things in your problem that have a really strong slant towards being original and effective and allows your team to shine with creativity. The spirit of the problem is all the components of the problems, what you're expected to do at bare minimum in terms of actually providing a solution to the problem. All right, so make sure you read over that section pretty carefully because it, it'll outline your problem for you and it'll highlight those creative opportunities and what's expected of your team at minimum uh, in the spirit of the problem. All right, so moving on from there, uh, we have what are the required elements? So the spirit of the problem gets to, in kind of a short form, uh, what's expected of the team. The limitations, the next section here, section B, as you can see in the problem, really outlines what is expected of the team, point by point in sort of a list format. And not only does it list those expectations, it also includes any sort of qualifications or limits to what the team must do. For example, uh, if a character has to be presented in the solution, sometimes that character must be played by a living, breathing team member and sometimes a character can be a puppet or a stuffed animal or whatever the case may be so this is where this is a part of the problem that those sort of clarifications those explanations and expectations are set right so it lists not only the requirements but also the limitations of those requirements right hence the, the name limitations all right so backing up a bit Section A, we just went over is the problem section B is the limitations and the limitations of all the problems include and tell you to read the program guide. This is probably like the 15th time I've told you, read the Odyssey of the Mind program guide. It is available as a PDF at odysseyofthemind.com. It's a general list of rules across all problems for all participants. Uh, it also comes in your membership packet, right? So when you got your problems in the mail, it comes as a booklet. But again, it's available for free as a PDF, odysseyofthemind.com, read it. Because all those rules apply to your solution. Uh, there's also a time limit for your solution. All teams are expected to perform their solution within eight minutes. If you go over the eight minutes, you get a penalty for going over the time if you are doing problem three or problem five, the performance-based problems, because part of solving those problems includes learning how to perform in a certain time frame. If you are doing a technical problem, like problem one, two, or four, time stops at eight minutes just because those problems often need time to reset the room for the next teams to come in, so we can't let teams go over, right? So just be aware you have eight minutes to present your solution across the board. All right. From there, there's also a cost limit for each long-term problem. Now, the cost limit will vary from problem to problem, right? So if you're doing problem one or problem two, maybe more technical problems that have a lot of components, you have to build a vehicle or maybe a machine, you might have a little bit of a higher cost limit because obviously some of those resources are going to creating the vehicle or the machine that you have to build for those problems. And maybe in problem three and problem five, where you're doing more performance-based uh, solutions, you maybe have a lower cost limit because you don't have to spend money on technical devices and other things that are required as part of the problem. Regardless, your cost limit is your cost limit and each problem has its own cost limit that you are not to exceed. You might be thinking, well, this seems unfair, but remember the point of the cost limit, one, is to keep things fair so all teams are working with the same amount of resources and two, adding that cost restriction forces you to be more creative. So it's actually a good thing, all right? So you have your time limit, your cost limit, this section is also going to tell you to read what's called clarifications. Clarifications are, as teams start solving these problems, they might have, I don't know, a question, something might not be clear in the long-term problem. So you're allowed to submit questions to the Odyssey of the Mind headquarters at odysseyofthemind.com, asking them specific questions about your long-term problem and your solution. Uh, and the, the team at Odyssey of the Mind headquarters will answer those questions. If they're specific to your solution that you don't want other teams knowing, they'll answer you directly and no one else will see it. If it's a general clarification, which means that all teams can benefit the same from knowing this, maybe there's a, a weird wording issue in the product problem, then that would be released on the Odyssey of Mind website that everyone can see. So you don't have to be worried that if you ask a question that other teams will know what you're doing to solve your problem because that's kept private when it's about your specific solution, right? Uh, and just so you know, there's the program guide, which is the rules across all the problems. Then there's your problem, which is more specific to what you're doing. And then there's clarifications, right? So uh, clarifications actually supersede these other levels. In other words, if maybe the program guide says you can or can't do something, but then a clarification comes out that says you can, 
then great, the clarification is what we're all working with, right? So just kind of know the order of importance on those. If you have questions, you can email Odyssey with mine and they'll, they'll explain. All right, the last thing is, and the most important thing is, limitations includes what your, your specific solution must include as part of the solution, all right? Uh, and the specific limitations, as I said, on those elements. So you can kind of see here, uh, but basically, you know, in this case, the team had to create an original performance that included a detective character, a real life mystery selected from a list, uh, a team created, three team created clues to solve the mystery. And so all those are listed in the limitations. And then what happens is they talk about the detective character and give limitations about what the detective character must and must not have. Uh, let's see, the real life mystery has to come from one of these listed here, must be part of the presentation. So you can see that each of the big numbers are things you must include and each of the subcomponents here, like ABC, are restrictions or limitations on those required elements, right? Because limitations enhance creativity, right? Uh, so that is limitation section. It's an extremely important part of your long-term problem because again, it's telling you, these are the expected elements that we are looking for in every solution. And here are the rules or the boundaries about how you can go about presenting those elements. Remember, if the problem doesn't say you cannot do something, then it's assumed that you can do something, right? So the limitations aren't meant to restrict your creativity, they're meant to enhance your creativity, to make you think outside the box on what can be more original, but also still effective at solving the problem. Okay, so moving on, um, we need to know what the points look like, right? How are these elements gonna be scored? So we skipped a section on the problem, the site set of a competition, you can look at that if you want to see what's expected, because the next most important part is the scoring. How are the points allocated or distributed across these required elements? So uh, something to note, some of these points are objective. Either you did something or you didn't do something. Uh, your vehicle either completed the task or didn't complete the task. So if it did the task, it did what it was supposed to do, it gets points, right? So it's five points or zero points, right? Or 10 points or zero points. So as long as you did or the vehicle did or the technical item did what it was supposed to do, you get the points. So that's objective, it's binary. It's either yes or no, right? But then there are also points that are subjective points, right? How creative is this costume? How creatively was the car built to complete the task? Those are the subjective opinion of the people, the judges, watching your solution, right? So maybe one judge thought it was very creative, maybe another judge thought it was sort of average creativity, uh, and those scores are averaged together. We'll talk about scoring in a later lesson, but just realize here that there are different types of scoring elements, objective, which is kind of yes, no, you did or you didn't, and subjective, which is more of a continuum based on somebody's subjective opinion. All right, uh, something I want to point out here, which teams tend to overlook, is you want to know what gets more points, right? So as I said to you in a prior lesson, if you're doing the vehicle problem, chances are the vehicle is where most of your points are going to be. If you're doing classics, most of your points are going to be about performance, the presentation, right, the characters. Um, so the categories kind of direct you as to where the points are going to be, but each specific long-term problem is different, right? So some years, maybe the technical problem, problem two, requires you to build a machine, which is a lot of points, but maybe that particular year, there's also a really strong performance element to it as well. So the theatrical components also get a lot of points, it just depends, right? So what you wanna do is make sure you look at section D of your long-term problem and see where the points are and how the points are allocated, because that's gonna tell you where you're gonna spend your time, right? Or where you should probably spend your time. Also know what gets fewer points, right? What gets fewer points? Maybe something that's not even scored at all, right? Maybe there's something that you or your team is thinking about doing that's not gonna get any points. You might wanna ask yourself, why would we do that if we don't get points for it, right? Um, so that's important, knowing what gets the most points, what gets less points or fewer points, and then what doesn't get scored at all, right? That has a lot to do with teaching teams in OM about how to allocate your resources wisely, both your financial resources and what you're spending money on, but also your time, right? Uh, I'll give you a fun anecdotal example. I remember one year, many years ago, I was doing a classics problem called vaudeville, and I painted a birdcage probably for like two hours. And it turns out this birdcage was getting zero points in our solution, and it was such a waste of time. I was a kid course, right? So what did I know? Uh, but it was a, an important learning lesson because I realized like, oh, I should have been spending more time on this costume, which was getting points, as opposed to this random prop on stage that was going to get zero points. It looked great. It was a lovely looking birdcage, but it didn't do anything to advance our solution. We still did very well that year. So I'm, I'm pleased to say I learned my lesson. We worked on other stuff, but that's the point. And that's how Odyssey teaches us, right? Through these sort of ways of thinking about allocation of resources and, and scoring, right? Great. 
Um, cool. So also re realize that in addition to scoring, to giving points, there's also what we call penalties, which are points that get taken away. Yikes, right? Now, I will point out that judges tend to avoid penalizing as much as possible. When we're judging, when I'm judging, we're not looking to penalize. Like, that's not what we want to do. Oftentimes, we have to because we have to keep the competition fair. So for example, if in classics, a team spends nine minutes solving their problem, presenting their solution, and every other team spends eight minutes because that's the limit, uh, the team that spent nine minutes gets an entire minute to give their solution, to talk more about whatever it is they've made, to show their costume, show their props. And therefore, competition is no longer fair because those students have taken an extra minute to highlight their solution. So they would get an overtime penalty commensurate with how much time they spent over the eight minute limit. Right? So it's not meant to punish, it's meant to basically teach and also to keep things fair in competition. And again, judges tend to avoid penalizing if they don't have to. So some of the penalties that are listed here, one is a spirit of the problem penalty. So a team, again, has solved the problem, they've done a lot of really cool things, but they didn't actually like solve the problem in terms of what the spirit of the problem said teams are expected to do, right? So they had a cool solution that had costumes and maybe it had devices that did certain things, but it didn't quite adhere to what the problem said it needed to do. They would still get points for what they've done, but they might get a little bit taken off for spirit of the problem because they didn't actually solve what the long-term problem asked for. Uh, unsportsmanlike conduct, pretty self-explanatory, be nice. Talk nice to your teammates, talk nice to other teams. Obviously, the mind, I've referred to it as the OM family many times. That's how we refer to it within the community. Uh, even alumni who haven't done the program for many years are still a part of the OM family. It's a supportive educational program for people who love creativity. So we try to be as supportive as possible. Very rarely have I ever seen the unsportsmanlike conduct um, from students or families at all. So, but it's there just to be safe. Incorrect membership sign. We haven't talked about a membership sign yet, but if you read the program guide, which I know you will, every team is required to provide a membership sign that has their team information on it. So the name of their school, whatever, so that judges can refer to it to make sure that they're judging the right team, right, and scoring the right team. Uh, if you have an incorrect or missing membership sign based on the program guide specifications, you might get some points taken up here. Again, this is something that rarely happens because teams read the program guide, they do the membership sign, and it's no big deal. Outside assistance. Now, this is a big one. Uh, again, we've already talked about what outside assistance is, but you would get points taken off if you, one, admit to having outside assistance on your outside assistance form. We have a whole lesson on paperwork later. Or if in questioning a, a judge, you know, is talking to somebody, one of the team members, and they said, oh, my mom actually sewed this, or oh, uh, my dad built this for us, or my mom built this for us, that would be outside assistance and the team would get some points off. Again, commensurate with how much work was actually done by somebody that's not on the team. So uh, we don't like to do that. We prefer that the, the students that you do all the work yourself. But if need be to keep competition fair, again, there would be an outside assistance penalty assessed just to make sure that the competition remains fair for that age division. Uh, and then finally here, there's over the cost limit or over the time limit. So we talked about time limit a little bit. Um, cost limit, same thing. If you're spending more money uh, than is budgeted in your problem, that creates unfairness for the, the competition. And so to sort of make it fair again, that's where penalty would be applied. Big takeaway from this is that Judges in OM do not enjoy penalizing teams. It's not like we don't come into competition that day to be like, where can we find penalties? The only time it's ever done is when a team has clearly violated a rule that they know. Uh, and also it's necessary to make competition fair because they're getting an unfair advantage if they're not penalized uh, for breaking the rules. All right, cool. Enough about that negativity. Uh, thinking about a calendar and schedule. So clearly there is a lot of work to be done. If you are looking at your long-term problem right now, you've read your problem, you've seen limitations, all the things you're expected to do, all the things you're getting scored on, you need to get it done by the time competition comes around, right? Because most of you will probably be competing either in person or virtually, and you wanna make sure that you have all your stuff ready to go. So with that said, it's up to you and to your team to determine a schedule that works for you, right? Now, what does that mean? Uh, well, think about all the stuff that needs to be created, right? If you're doing the vehicle problem, you've got vehicles to build, you've got skits to write. If you're doing uh, the balsa problem, you have structures to build, to test, to see which one's the strongest, and also a skit to write and costumes to make and backdrops to make. Uh, when do you need to have everything done, right? So by competition, surely if you're gonna compete, some teams like to have their solutions ready a few weeks prior to competition, so they can just practice, practice, practice as they get ready for competition. Uh, and as opposed to finishing the night before and then basically presenting the day of competition. Uh, how long will you need to practice your solution? So this gets into the idea of giving yourself some time to practice your solution when everything is built and ready. 
uh, whether or not you're going to meet in person or online and how often you intend to meet. A lot of times students will meet after school or on the weekends to solve the problem when they're doing it through their school. Sometimes it's a part of class, like they'll meet during the school day for you know, an hour or so. Uh, sometimes students meet online, right? In the 2020-2021 year, you've heard me say that you have a virtual option this year, so you can actually meet online via Zoom and Skype and these other, other technological mediums or through these other technological media. Uh, so just know how much time you're going to need to have those meetings as well. And then who will do what, right? How will you work as a team? Part of the benefit of working on these problems as a team is that you are not expected to do everything. Now, if you're solving the problem on your own, it's totally feasible and doable. You'll create your own costumes, create your own backdrops, perform your own uh, performance, your own skit. But if you're working as a team, maybe somebody's really good at doing costumes. So that person takes on the costumes. Maybe somebody's really good at doing music, uh, maybe two people. So they go and they write an original song for the team. So just be thinking about how you can allocate different responsibilities uh, and different obligations for team members to do so that you work as a team and you come together uh, to make your solution your solution. All right, uh, last thing I wanna talk about here is this idea of big picture details, big picture. So first things first, don't forget, your goal here is to solve the long-term problem. So when we go back to your long-term problem, look at section A where it says the problem, talks about the creative emphases and talks about the spirit of the problem. That is the problem, the big problem you are trying to solve. Now, point two, the problem consists of very specific elements that you must include and those elements have restrictions or limitations placed on them. That's section B of our long-term problem, right? All the things you must include and all the requirements and qualifications about those different elements. So that's where we're getting into the details. We're getting into the weeds of, okay, we gotta have this character and this costume and these three things, pieces of art, whatever, right? All that is specified in section B of your long-term problem. Now, when you're done, after you've come up with all those specific elements, you need to remember to take a step back and ask yourself, okay, did we solve the problem? Let's go back and look at section A, look at those creative emphases, look at the spirit of the problem and say, with all these detailed things we created from limitation section B and all the cool devices we built, our vehicle, our structure, whatever, whatever your long-term problem says, did we actually solve the problem, the big picture problem? If the answer is yes, wonderful, congratulations, you've done it. If the answer is no, then you might need to think, okay, what do we need to do to make sure that it's clear we have solved the problem that is being asked, all right? So keep in mind, start with the big picture, come up with your ideas, whatever, do how you wanna do it. Then you have to focus on those details and limitations, right? Addressing each limitations as they're spelled out in your specific long-term problem. And once you've done that, take a step back again at the end and say, did we actually solve the problem? Right? Did we do what we were asked to do? Uh, and hopefully the answer will be yes. All right, so moving on to our progress report. Do you understand what your specific long-term problem is now that you've selected one? What are you expected to do, right? So read section A of your long-term problem from top to bottom so you know exactly what's expected of you. Uh, number two, know what elements your solution must include, right? So this is a limitation section. Section B of your long-term problem will spell out in detail what's expected of you and what limitations there are on what's expected, okay? Uh, and then question three, do you know what elements will be scored and how they will be scored, right? Uh, this will help you and your team allocate your time and know what to focus your attention on because that's what the judges are going to be scoring you on the day of competition. Uh, and it'll allow you to be a lot more efficient in terms of solving your problem, right? So make sure that you pay attention to section D, which is your scoring sec section of your long-term problem. All right, so uh, what have we done today? Well, now you're beginning, hopefully, to develop a solution for your long-term problem. If not, if you haven't started already, you might start after this lesson, right? Because you know exactly what the problem statement is in the long-term problem. You know what the limitations, the expectations are of you and your team. And now you know to focus on what's being scored in the long-term problem, your specific long-term problem. What you do, what you dream up, what your ideas are, are completely up to you. Again, I can't help, that's outside assistance. But now you know how to look at the problem, identify what the problem actually is, what the limitations and expectations are, and how those things will be scored. So based on that, based on those tools, you have the tools necessary to really start digging in and solving your problem. So uh, looks like, looks like, excuse me, next level, you've well, hopefully you'll develop a solution for your long-term problem. Uh, but now we're gonna talk about scoring and limitations to focus and edit your long-term problem solution. So that will be uh, in our next lesson and I'll see you then.